Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Hi everyone, bonjour tout le monde, ça me fait un plaisir d'être ici avec vous. Euh, J'ai euh, juste eu une uh, uh, très importante conversation uh, avec uh, les Canadiens Canadiens qui habitent dans mon comté. On a, on a été focusé sur les défis autour du logement. Uh, Uh, on a pris l'opportunité de parler du compte d'épargne libre d'impôt pour l'achat d'une première propriété. Mais pour moi, uh, la chose la plus importante était d'être à l'écoute, d'être à l'écoute surtout uh, aux jeunes Canadiens et Canadiennes. Um, so, hi everyone, thank you very much for being here. Um, and uh, thank you very much for the Y for hosting us. I really appreciate it. Um, Uh, we're here in my riding of University Rosedale, and it's been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry about that, guys. Um, and it's been a chance. I've just um, had a chance to have a really useful conversation um, with young Canadians, many of them people who live in my riding, who've actually been in touch with my constituency office. Um, we focused on a challenge that I think many young Canadians would define as the single biggest challenge in their lives, and that is the challenge of housing and affordability. And they talked about the challenges that they're facing in their lives. Um, it was a chance for me and um, for some people in, the finan in financial services to highlight the first home savings account, which has been available since April and actually has had very, very strong pickup. A lot of particularly young Canadians are using this as a way to save for that first down payment. And many of the people around the table talked about how they do already have a first home savings account. So it was an opportunity to highlight that. Um, but mostly for me, it was an opportunity to hear uh, from young Canadians, from people in my own community. Um, about the challenges they're facing. Okay, et je suis prête à répondre à vos questions. Right. Happy to answer your questions. Um, welcome to today's press conference. It'll be one question, one follow-up. Bien la conférence de presse, ce sera une question et une question en suivi. Merci. Uh, good morning, Deputy Prime Minister Simon Dingley from uh, CBC National News. Uh, uh, Ms. Freeland, Poland has uh, call, called one of its consuls back because he wouldn't gather information on the social and political activities of Polish Canadians. How do you feel about foreign governments uh, gathering information on Canadian citizens, and what is your government going to do about it? Okay, um, well, thank you for the question, Simon, and I'm unaware of the specific incident that you mentioned, so I'm not going to comment on that specifically. Um, but let me just say generally, um, our government is very aware, I think all Canadians are very aware, um, that foreign interference is happening in Canada, and foreign interference really isn't acceptable, and it's something that our government uh, is very focused on, and very focused on protecting Canada and our democracy. Uh, Madame Vice Premier Ministre Pujoua, the same response in French about the situation with Pol Pologne now? Uh, oui. Uh, merci beaucoup, Simon. Uh, 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 C'est uh, une nouvelle pour moi. Uh, 
Alors, je ne vais pas commenter cette situation en particulier, euh, mais je peux dire en général que euh, l'ingérence étrangère, c'est vraiment un enjeu pour le Canada, pour les Canadiens et Canadiens et pour notre démocratie. Et notre gouvernement est très, très clair que euh, on doit faire tous pour protéger notre pays et notre démocratie. Okay, thank you. And second question, uh, an Ontario question, uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. How do you feel about Ontario's Premier Doug Ford saying he will not revisit land swaps in uh, the Green Belt, just north of Toronto, despite Ontario's Attorney General Bonnie Lissick saying the Ford government was influenced by developers? You know, um, I know that the Green Belt is really, really important for very many people in Ontario. Um, this is such a beautiful province and our nature is really, really important to us. It's important for us to treasure it. I think uh, everyone in Ontario followed the Auditor General's report very closely yesterday and I think specific questions on that report are for the provincial government to answer. Okay. Um, en français aussi, s'il vous plaît. Um, je pense que tous les Ontariens, Ontariennes, uh, apprécient énormément la beauté naturelle de cette uh, magnifique province. C'est très important pour nous tous. Uh, concernant uh, l'analyse uh, de Madame Lissick, uh, je pense que tous les gens de notre province ont suivi à l'annonce hier, mais c'est pour la province de répondre aux questions qu'elle a posées. Thank you very much. Okay, next question. Prochaine question. Uh, Ian Bix with the Canadian Press. Uh, just on the home savings plan, uh, could I say that it is going to further inflate prices? Uh, what do you prefer to do to actually reduce housing prices to make housing more affordable for everyone? Um, well, first of all, on the first home savings account, uh, we launched it to make it easier for young people to buy a home. And hearing from young people who live in my riding, uh, some of whom have gotten directly in touch with my office, that's one of the reasons, one of the ways that we were able to find people. You know, what they really were saying is this is a crisis and this is an intergenerational crisis. And I really recognize that. And that's why I really believe that it's important for us at the federal level, the provincial level, the municipal level, to put forward all the tools we can to resolve this crisis. And in particular, to help the people who are being affected by it the most. And very, very often, this is a challenge that confronts young people particularly. So I am glad to see the take up of the first home savings account for people buying their first home. Um, that's a group that we particularly need to support. I'm glad that people are recognizing this is a way to help save for their down payment and that people are using that. I also agree with the premise of the question that a big challenge the core challenge is just the math of Canada's population, uh, Canada's housing stock. We do need to build more homes for a growing country. I think it's a really good thing that the Canadian economy is growing and that Canada's population is growing. It's also the case that the housing supply is not keeping up and our government is absolutely focused on working with provinces, with municipalities, to get more homes built in Canada. The Housing Accelerator Fund, um, which is now available for billion dollars to create a real race to the top for Canadian municipalities to come to us with plans to get more homes built. That's one example of the work we're doing. We have a great new Minister of Housing and Infrastructure. I'm actually going to be talking to him this afternoon. Um, this meeting was one way for me to get ready for that conversation. And I can assure you, he is laser focused, I am laser focused, the Prime Minister is laser focused on getting more homes built for a growing country. And what's your sense of how much housing prices need to fall to achieve affordability? Uh, again, um, 
that question was yours. Uh, those were not my words. Um, what I will say is we recognize that housing affordability is a huge challenge for a lot of Canadians, especially Canadians like the young people I was speaking to today. And we also recognize a key part of the solution is simple to say, hard to accomplish. And that is simply get more homes built in Canada. We're focused on that. Thank you. Next question. Prochaine question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Kurt Brownage with Global News. Um, what should Canadians think um, after the Prime Minister recently in Hamilton uh, was saying housing is not primarily a federal responsibility? I think Canadians understand that, like so many big challenges that our country faces, the only way we are going to solve this challenge is with the federal government, the provincial government, and municipal governments working together. And I really believe that Canada is at its best. We are at our best when we find a way for all three levels of government to work together. And I know we can do it. You know, my experience with the NAFTA negotiations was we were strong because we had a Team Canada approach. I think our experience during COVID, which was a tragedy where, you know, every single COVID death was a tragedy. And of course, we could learn lessons about how to do better. But broadly, Canada did pretty well. And the reason we did well is because we had a real ta Team Canada approach, federal, provincial, municipal. That kind of Team Canada approach is the thinking that we need to bring forward to solve the housing crisis. And I know that is very much the view of the Prime Minister. And a quick follow-up. Um, you're promoting the first-time homebuyer savings account today, but only two major financial institutions in the country are currently offering the account. What do you say to Canadians who want to open such an account but um, can't do it with the bank they're with? Well, it is now available um, from two of the main financial institutions and a number of other financial institutions, two of whom were represented here today. Um, what we have heard, which is really encouraging, is from the institutions that are currently offering the first home savings account, is it is ex the uptake is exceeding their expectations. They are finding there are a lot of Canadians, particularly young Canadians, who recognize that this is a great way to save for a first home. And so I think one of my messages today, one, I have two messages about the first home savings account today. One is to be sure that young Canadians are aware that this exists and it's not going to solve all their problems. I am not claiming that, but it's a little bit of help and I want people to know that that help is there. And also a message to Canada's financial institutions um, that this is a savings, a, a way to save that young Canadians, you know, they're voting with their money. They're putting their money into these first home savings accounts at the institutions that make it available. It would be great to see it, to see this first home savings account more readily available across the country. And I did hear from one of the young people at, in the conversation today um, that he wants to open an account, has struggled a little bit with the mechanics. Thank you. with an update on Mali, uh, where our peacekeeping colleagues are telling us that, the, uh, they're expedited, that they are expediting their withdrawal from Bear in the Timbuktu region by one day due to a deteriorating security situation in the area, including risks to the safety and security of UN personnel. The national authorities were promptly informed. The mission reported two attacks yesterday on a convoy carrying personnel and equipment from the base at Bear to Timbuktu, resulting in four Burkina Bees peacekeepers suffering injuries. Fortunately, those are not life-threatening. We condemn the attacks and call on parties to ensure safe movement for peacekeepers throughout the withdrawal period as the mission endeavors to hand over bases and previously mandated responsibilities to the Malian authorities, the UN country team, and the UN Office for West Africa and the Sahel. 
As a rule, the UN peacekeeping mission in Mali can only transfer its facilities to the Malian state. In this context, the UN is in discussions with the Malian authorities on a draft agreement that will govern the transfer of UN peacekeeping camps. In parallel, whenever uh, the UN peacekeepers depart a camp, the designated representative of the Malian authorities uh, is requested to attest to the state of the camp and the facilities and also to confirm that we have fulfilled our environmental obligations. Quick humanitarian update uh, for you from uh, Niger, where our team continues to deliver aid despite the challenges, including the ongoing rainy season. Last week, 22,000 people in the Maradi region, in the center of the country, received cash assistance and food items. We and our humanitarian partners are also working with de facto authorities to identify and prepare a site to accommodate about 13,000 internally displaced uh, people in the Uru uh, Galajo in, uh, in the Tilerbari region. These people were displaced from several villages in the region in, mid that, in, in that region in mid-July before the current political crisis. Uh, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs tells us they are deeply concerned by reports of deadly clashes in South Darfur in Sudan that took place in recent days. The violence has displaced an estimated 20,000 people from several neighborhoods around the state capital in Yala town. That's according to preliminary results um, preliminary reports excuse me from the uh, from the uh, International Organization for Migration. Our humanitarian colleagues are closely monitoring the situation and are working to facilitate the delivery of humanitarian assistance to South Darfur. Unfortunately, the clashes are currently hampering any uh, transport of aid into Nyala from East Darfur. Uh, turning to Ukraine, uh, the, humanitarian the UN humanitarian coordinator there, Denise Brown, condemned a new wave of attacks over the weekend which once again damaged houses, hospitals and schools and killed and injured dozens of people, including children. Our humanitarian colleagues noted that the frontline communities in Kherson and neighboring Zaporizhzhia regions were particularly impacted. In the Kherson region, an entire family, including a baby, was reportedly killed in their homes by shelling in the Shiroka Balka village. According to our humanitarian colleagues on the ground, Odessa was also hit yesterday with residential houses and education facilities being damaged. Meanwhile, we continue to support people across Ukraine. Last week, two interagency convoys delivered assistance to frontline communities in Donetsk and Zaporizhzhia region. The convoy delivered bottled water, food, medicines, shelter materials, hygiene kits, household items to support more than 15,000 people who remain in these areas. More than 7.3 million people in Ukraine have received aid so far since January 1st. A total of 18 million people uh, need support. Uh, turning to Bosnia-Herzegovina, the UN resident coordinator uh, there, Ingrid McDonald, expressed her deep sorrow and extends her condolences to the families of victims of the tragic shooting that took place in Gr uh, Gr Gradat Church. On Friday, uh, we are horrified by the fact that the murder of a woman was live streamed via a social media network, which is one of the latest attacks in a streak of femicide and severe cases of gender based violence in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Femicide, the inter intentional killing of women and girls based on their gender, represents a glaring and grave violation of human rights. Tomorrow, we will be joined virtually by our good friend Gordon Brown, who is, as you know, the UN Special Envoy for Global Education and the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Uh, he will join us virtually to brief you on the issue of girls' education in Afghanistan. Um, finally, a little quiz if you're ready for some action. Uh, Benno, no cheating. Google is off. Uh, no, you're no longer on probation, but one. One more Googling will get you uh, out of the briefing. Um, this African nation has 16 official languages, five UNESCO World Heritage Sites, and had a legendary concert by a um, reggae icon perform at its um, ceremony to mark its independence in 1980, in April 1980. Oh, very disappointed. Zimbabwe, who was the singer? Yeah, ah, even more disappointing. 
uh, legendary concert by, uh, our, by Bob Marley. Um, so thank you to our friends in Harare, 129 fully paid up member states. Let's try this. Can you name two of those languages of the 16 official languages? There you go. You've been redeemed. <laughs> no, we'll still go to Edie. Uh, thank you, Steph. Um, two questions. First, um, the military, current military rulers of Niger have uh, said that they are going to put the elected president on trial on charges of high treason. Does the Secretary General have any comment, and is the UN trying to take any specific action? Well, it's obviously a very, uh, very worrying uh, declaration. We remain extremely concerned about uh, the state of being, uh, the health and safety of, uh, of the president and his family. And again, we call for his immediate and unconditional release. And his reinstatement as head of state, of course. And is the UN trying to do anything on the ground to uh, reverse this? Well, on the political end, uh, as you know, uh, Special Envoy, or excuse me, our uh, Special Representative for um, uh, for West Africa, Mr. Shimao, uh, was in Abuja. Uh, he continues to work very closely with ECOWAS and the AU. It's very important that uh, the, the UN, the regional organizations, sub-regional organizations present a united front, which, uh, uh, which we would hope will move to the reversal of the situation. And a follow-up on your Mali announcement. Mm -hmm. um, is the, is the United Nations required to leave all the facilities in the camp in the camp when it departs? For instance, can it take all the furniture? Can it take, uh, you know, all the equipment? What, what is it required to leave? Uh, I, I hope to have a bit more granularity on all of that, but I can tell you that what we own and what we can take, we will take. If there are things that are handed over, uh, they are. Uh, it will be clearly noted that they are handed over, whether it's you know desks or chairs. Uh, but obviously, all the contingent-owned equipment, uh, weapons, and all of that will leave. Sherwin, Steph, follow up on Niger. Um, ECOWAS has essentially signaled that while they prefer a diplomatic route here that they've activated a standby force mm -hmm. as a last resort. Does the Secretary General support that formula? Diplomacy first, but in the well, event I, I that we, fails... I think we've always uh, support uh, diplomacy. The Secretary General very much feels that, you know, the, and this is part of his, his, um, his approach, in a sense, to a lot of peace and security issues, which is to ensure that sub-regional and regional organizations are, are in, the, in, in the primary lead, so to speak, uh, and it is up to them to take the decisions they wish to take. Uh, Benno, then Madame, and then Madame. Thank Monsieur. you. Also, uh, a follow-up to Mali. Can you give us a picture about like, how much hostility the departing MINUSMA forces are facing? From what you said, it appears like it could be like an increasing uh, amount of hostilities, and I heard myself that uh, departing convoys on their way out of the country were attacked and... I mean, there have been incidents of, of, I mean, as we said today, there have been security incidents. Uh, they have been, uh, but there have been also security incidents in Mali for a long time. I mean, as you know, uh, the, the mission in Mali sadly ho uh, is in the lead in terms of UN peacekeepers that have been killed in the line of duty and, and, and injured. Uh, as far as I know, we are not facing hostility from the population. I think that's very important. Uh, that's very important to, to note. And, and the peacekeepers have been there and have given their lives to help the people of Mali. Madame. Monsieur, according to IOM, more than 1,800 people have died at sea between North Africa and Italy, more than double the number last year. 
Uh, what I'd like to know is what is the UN doing other than reporting figures? Uh, this migrant, migrant that they left their country because of the war the Occident created. Let's say Afghan, Syrian, Libyans. So what are we doing? I mean, Can't it's, we it's, stop it's a, that? It, in terms of stopping the wars, it is up to uh, the, the people, and mostly men, should we say, who have their fingers on the trigger. Whether, and, and we see conflict as a major driver of, of population movement. That's, that's a fact. Uh, we continue to push for a greater agenda for peace, greater development, greater human rights. All of these issues, uh, when go badly, are drivers of, of population movement. In terms of the Mediterranean, we've been reporting those very numbers uh, from here. The Secretary General has expressed his, uh, his deep sorrow and anger at, this, at the situation. I think he's been very clear uh, in the fact that there is a shared responsibility from all European Union countries when you're talking about, uh, you're talking about the Mediterranean uh, to create more legal pathways for, for migration. Migration is, it's a thing. People are always going to be on the move. And when there's violence, you have refugees who are seeking, uh, who are seeking, uh, seek, seeking shelter. We have the, the framework in place, the global compacts on, 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 on migration. We have international refugee law. Those things need to be upheld. Ms. Salome. Thank you, Steph. Uh, we're all eagerly awaiting the Secretary General's report on Haiti. I'm wondering Indeed. if you have any updates on that, if we can expect that today. Uh, uh, continue your eagerness. <laughs> uh, we should have, it should be out, uh, it should be out next, uh, in the next few days. Madame. In the next few days. Yep. Thank you. My question is uh, on Afghanistan. Uh, it's two years since the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan. UN experts uh, accuse the Taliban of systematic abuse of human rights, particularly of women and girls. There's this deepening humanitarian crisis, this sense among Afghan women that they've been an, abandoned by the international community. At this stage, what does the Secretary General think needs to be done? What is the answer here? The an I mean, the immediate answer is that those in power in Afghanistan need to give to women and girls in Afghanistan the, the, the rights and the dignity they are owed, that every man, woman, and child is, is, is owed, but that we, we've seen all the, the, the reversals um, week by week almost in, in Afghanistan the last two years that are pushing women and girls in Afghanistan further and further away from the human rights that are theirs, right? And that is obviously not only having an impact on the individuals, it is having an impact on Afghanistan as a whole. It is, it is, um, it is moving Afghanistan away from the development that any country um, should have. But with respect, the UN's been saying that yeah. for, for two years. What is going to compel the Taliban to change course? Uh, listen, if, if, I, if, if, um, if we had the actual answer, if we held the key or the secret code to what will happen, I would have hoped we would have used it. Uh, what will compel them is a united front from the international community, uh, keeping the issue first and foremost in, in, in the spotlight. Um, but those who have influence, who have direct lines of communications with the Taliban need to use that influence and those direct lines to the benefit of women and girls in Afghanistan. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dujarik. Ali Rajabi, IRI, Iran's State TV correspondent. Uh, <clears throat> what's the Secretary General's position regarding a terrorist attack on innocent people in the city of Shiraz in Iran, uh, the, the shrine of the Shah Jarrah? Uh, the Secretary General strongly condemns uh, the terrorist attack that we saw on the holy site uh, in Shiraz on, the, on, on 13 August yesterday, uh, which is, as you know, the second attack 
uh, in the last 10 months. Uh, acts targeting religious sites, places of worship are abhorrent. The Secretary General stresses the need to bring justice the perpetrators of this crime against civilians exercising their right to practice their religion freely. The Secretary General conveys his deepest condolences uh, to the bereaved families uh, and the people of the Islamic uh, Republic of Iran, and he wishes a speedy recovery to those injured. Yes, sir. Thank you. This is Labluan, sir, from Bangladesh, Pratitin. The establishment of a loss and damage fund was a significant outcome of the COP27, marking the result of years of advocacy from climate, vulnerable developing nations. This fund intends to offer financial support to countries, including those most affected by climate change, like Bangladesh. How will this matter be addressed at the upcoming Climate Ambitious Summit schedule, which will take place next month in UN headquarters? Could you also provide insights into the UN Secretary General's stance on this issue? Well, the Secretary General feels that the loss and damage uh, fund is a, a critical part of addressing uh, the devastating impact of climate change, who we know has been, uh, as we all know, has been uh, much more severe on those countries that have uh, contributed the, less, the least uh, to our changing climate, who have been emitting the least uh, uh, harmful uh, chemicals into our uh, into our air, and we know how vulnerable Bangladesh is, is with its uh, its coastline. We very much hope that at the upcoming summit, uh, the uh, member states and, and heads of delegations uh, will come with strong um, acts and action that will help to fulfill the promises uh, that were made at the COP. Steph, um, Israeli and Lebanese delegations are traveling to New York this week to discuss UNIFIL with a number mm -hmm. of um, officials here in Security Council ambassadors. Is the Secretary General holding a meeting with either of those delegations, and how active a role does the Secretary General plan on playing in the UNIFIL uh, renewal if, mandate? If it's, uh, if it's this week, uh, no, because the Secretary General will be back. Uh, Even remotely? Uh, even remotely. Okay. Uh, that does not take away from the importance uh, that we carry on, uh, that, the, the importance that we, um, um, excuse me, it's my first day back. All good. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, this doesn't, uh, doesn't change the importance uh, that we've invested in, in the work of UNIFIL, in the need for the, the mandate to be renewed, as the Secretary General has uh, recommended. I think UNIFIL plays a critical role uh, along the blue line and in a stabilizing factor uh, between Israel and Lebanon. Obviously, as with any peacekeeping mission, the renewal of the mandate is in the hands of the 15 members of the Security Council. Why not? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, again, it's about Bangladesh election. On August 21st, 2004, the Bangladesh Nationalist Party carried out a grenade attack so I, I would I, I would love to go straight to a question and not go back twenty years, without. Uh, but it was really. I, no, I. I but, but what is it? What is the question? The incident resulted in tragic loss of forty lives and left over five hundred people injured. It was a terrorist incident. Now again, ahead of the next general election, which will be held next year, January, Bangladesh Nationalist Party (BNP) is involving themselves in vandalism uh, in Bangladesh. So I think what uh, is on, on, the, on, on the views of uh, the upcoming elections, I would refer you to what we've been saying for quite, uh, quite some time on the, uh, on the elections in the transcript. That has not been changed. Um, I think we do have a question uh, online from Zahara. Please, Zahara. Hi, Esteve. Hi. Uh, uh, my question on regarding terrorist attack in Shiraz, can we expect a condemnation uh, from Security Council? Uh, does the Security Council has a double standard in condemning terrorists or no? Uh, Zahar, that is a question you need to ask the presidency of the Security Council, Security Council members. Uh, they are, the, the council members uh, are not people I speak uh, for. Beno. Thank you. You're welcome. Beno. 
Thank you. Um, if, if you didn't say something about that uh, already, uh, Egypt, the massacre in Rabah Square is 10 years today. It's 10 years ago. Does the Secretary General have any comment on this most deadly incident in Egypt? I, I have no, no, no more comment than what we said at the, at the time. It never went to court. It was um, uh, the now President Sisi ordered the attack as the army chief uh, should it ha should have. I mean, as, as a matter of rule, there always needs to be accountability. But I have I have nothing more to say than what we said at the time. Let's go. Thank you. Uh, my question is on Haiti this time. Yep. Um, there's this move by the U.S. to uh, send uh, to ask Kenya to send police. Uh, the police force to Haiti to help with the security situation there. Um, but human rights groups in Kenya have accused the Kenyan police of uh, serious human rights abuses, uh, brutality, including the shooting dead of protesters. Uh, recently, UN human rights experts have also raised these concerns. So my question is, is this really a police force that the Secretary General wants to see on the streets of Haiti? I'm not going to get into, I'm not going to get ahead of whatever uh, member states will, will decide. But what I can tell, I mean, um, and also we don't even know what, what format that, that will take. The only thing I can point you to is that we do for peacekeeping missions, uh, which, again, and I'm not speaking about Haiti, but in general when these are, when there are troops deployed, or police officers deployed under a UN flag, uh, they go through a uh, human rights due diligence policies, which looks at the individual names of police officers and, and soldiers that are, that are sent, and they go through a human rights screening. See you tomorrow. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.